Welcome artists, painters, filmmakers, dancers, video game developers, and anyone in the creative industries. Glad you're joining us here as we talk about Hollywood. Have you ever heard someone say that God hates Hollywood? It's too corrupt, too sexualized, too violent, and too graphic. Well, I'm not going to argue that those things aren't happening in Los Angeles or New York or other centers for media, Austin, Texas, London, Paris, wherever. I'm not going to argue there aren't massive amounts of content being created that I won't let my kids watch. And I don't watch some of that content either because I don't think it's good for my soul. But the question is not whether there is objectionable content. The question is whether God hates Hollywood. Here are three questions I'm going to answer today. The first core question is, can God redeem Hollywood? The second core question, would God want to redeem it? And the third core question is, if God does want to, how does God redeem cities and entire industries? How do we see that in the Bible? That's what I talk about right now. Welcome. I'm Joel Pelsu, president of Arts and Entertainment Ministries. Our passion is helping you as a creative professional to succeed in your creative life while growing deeper in your spiritual walk. Because your creativity and your spirituality are designed by God to work in concert with one another. And that's our passion, helping you do that. If that's your passion, take a second, hit the like and subscribe buttons for our channel and share it with your friends. Help us get the word out. That'd be great. Now, some people will say Hollywood is evil and they equate Hollywood with evil intentions of some studios or some individuals at those studios. But there's so many people working on films and TV that don't have creative control. They have no influence on the content or messaging. There are teamsters and grips and various people on many sets who are devout Christians trying to be salt and light. There are also actors and actresses who want to honor God and are striving to be salt and light. You see, it's just overly simplistic to label an entire industry as evil. Are there people here with dark desires and evil intents? Of course. Are there people with dark desires and evil intents in New York and the stock market and investment bankers? Of course. What about Washington, D.C.? I don't think anybody finds it hard to believe there are people obsessed with power and people who have evil desires in politics. We have a number of TV shows about that. But if we stand back, we recognize there are also good people in finance, good people in politics, and there are good people in entertainment. Even the world of education and academia is also full of people who are good, who love our children. But there are those teachers pushing evil identity politics, promoting sexual confusion in the classroom, instead of teaching math, reading, and writing. Education is not evil. It's a good thing. Some educators maybe shouldn't be educators. But education per se remains a good thing. So here's the point. To call any one industry evil is failing to consider nuance and complexity of the people in that industry. There are very few industries we can call evil, and no, they're completely evil. For instance, human trafficking. We can all agree it is evil and agree there's never a justification for it. If you don't agree with that, you got a big problem. Everyone involved in that is participating in something evil. That is an evil industry, should be abolished. But when we look at politics, finance, and entertainment industry, and education, we should be able to recognize they're full of all kinds of people. There are Christians, Jews, atheists, agnostics, as well as every beautiful skin color and ethnicity which God has created to make the world more beautiful. All those people are involved. So let's not say it's all evil. There are evil components, and sometimes it feels worse than others, just like it does in Washington, D.C., or in New York in the finance industry. But God is busy redeeming all things. He doesn't give up. Okay, so let's get into it. First, we need to be honest about Hollywood's reputation. You know, Hollywood's reputation, both through its content and through the words and actions of elites in Hollywood, is that it's overly promiscuous, rebellious, and sexualized content has also been created by Hollywood for over 100 years. This is not brand new. It's way back in the 1900s that the reputation of Hollywood in the area of drugs and sex and even instances of rape here in Hollywood, the publicity got so bad, the industry agreed to abide by the Hayes Code to preemptively stop censorship. But the people who had been creating such content and reveling in sex and drugs didn't leave Hollywood. Now, things were better for a while in Hollywood. But the sexual revolution emerged in our culture, and also about the same time, the Motion Picture Association began a new rating system, such as PG, PG-13, and R-rated films. So instead of all movies adhering to the Hayes Code. Now, 
there are different ratings for different content. And you could do something graphic or sexual. It's just going to be rated R, NC-17 or something else. But the downside is that, again, it opened the door for certain kinds of content. And the most common complaints from then until now are glamorizing evil and graphic violence. Now, I don't need to do a dive into these topics fully right now, but I do want to say a few things. Violence is not a problem in and of itself. The Bible has plenty of violence. The question is more about whether there are consequences for violence, whether violence is glorified or glamorized. You know, the Bible can be graphic about events like the death of Jezebel. It says in 2 Kings, they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. That's pretty graphic. But think about it compared to some films today. We're not told by second by second how she was trampled, how the blood gushed and splattered all over the city streets, and how each part of her body became separated from the rest. We don't need some slow motion reveling in the splattering of blood, this grotesque thing. Why? Because the point is justice for the evil Jezebel did, and the fulfillment of a prophecy on her life for the evil she's done. You see, dwelling on the details only creates a fascination with death, dismemberment, grotesque things. And that can be toxic for your soul. So while there's violence in the Bible, it is not glorified and glamorized. This is the difference between the Bible addressing violence and a Quentin Tarantino film. Now, there are other distinctions between mediums, the written word versus the visual uh, medium, and those are other discussions we have had many times here at our house, and we have that in our institute. But right now, I just want to make that one clear distinction. Now, the other difference between violence in the Bible and some of the movies today is that the violence in the Bible always had consequences. Simply put, evil people eventually have to face the consequences. You know, Jesus himself spoke of this in Matthew 28. He rebuked Peter for using a sword against a Roman soldier, saying, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. The more common phrase we use today is, Live by the sword, die by the sword. Straight from Jesus' mouth. And if movies allow violent characters to never face consequences, it results in portraying an unjust world and a world without a just God. See, these movies can enable people to consider that they can do evil things in real life and never face the consequences, which fosters evil in their imagination and possibly eventually in their actions. Not saying always or necessarily causes it, but it can open a door to that. The other issue is glorifying sexuality outside of marriage between a man and a woman. If you see a steamy sex scene depicted in a film or imply it, it is almost always between two people who are not married. And these affairs and premarital sex are almost always depicted as the greatest rush, the greatest excitement and passion, and leading an audience to believe the most satisfying sexual relationship is not in marriage. Marriage where is boring. But outside of marriage, that's where the excitement is. This undermines the sanctity of marriage and the beauty of sexual intimacy within marriage. But the most ridiculous part of this is that there are rarely any consequences. What I mean is, most of the time in films, the woman never gets pregnant. No one struggles with guilt and shame over the affair, at least more than a few seconds. And no one ever gets a sexually transmitted disease, which people get all the time. It's complete fiction, offered to the public as real. And some people will say, hey, if you don't like it, don't watch it, change the channel. Fair enough, I think we should change the channel. That is an individual decision, but I'm also concerned about the least among us, children, people who can be easily influenced by media. You see, we're not only concerned with ourselves. This has an impact on society and upon the world that consumes our content. These lifestyles of drugs, sex, and selfish pursuits have the result of leading to greater drug use, sexual promiscuity, sexually transmitted diseases, and promoting non-biblical ideas about sexual identity. And, and the evidence is, is everywhere about the impact of films upon uh, behaviors. Hollywood seems to revel in the very programming that undermines self-control or restraint. And to be fair, there are movies that do not do this, but they are in the minority. Just try watching movies with a 10 to 12 year old and see how much content in movies is inappropriate, unnecessary, and distasteful. If you're an adult, you may just accept it as normal and move on. But the impact on a child is significant. And to be truthful, over time, it can have an impact on you as an adult. The third concern for us as believers is not just the issue of sex and violence, but the way the mainstream TV, movies, and video games often portray Christians 
and God. So they portray Christians as the fool, as ignorant, and they're preaching to the world a negative and condescending attitude to people who believe in Jesus. It's often subtle, but it can also be overt. And you may ask, why does all this matter, Joel? Well, it matters because this entertainment can have a powerful influence on our culture, and especially on the young people. Statistics have shown this to be true for decades. Things we create in films influence people's choices. It's not even up for debate. This is why people lobby to get cigarettes out of movies. People in the industry lobbied for this because they knew it was promoting young people to smoke cigarettes. They don't deny that. They know it's true. That's why they fought against it. That's why drug use movies usually results in a higher motion picture association rating. They know the impact. So if that's in the movie, they raise the level, the age level at which it's appropriate. And ostensibly that's so kids don't see it. But now we live in a world where kids are seeing all kinds of rated movies and TV on their computer and their phones. So in some ways, the MPA rating doesn't really do anything anymore. It's not stopping anyone from seeing anything. It's only helping people who are responsible to watch the kind of content they want and avoid the content they won't. It's not really stopping children from seeing things that are inappropriate. But this kind of content does influence people. That's why it's important to consider what is the overall message being given about Christ, about Christianity, about faith, about God, and how does that shape young Christians' minds as well as people's minds who might be interested in Christianity, but it turns them away from it? These are significant questions. And if you want to dive deeper in thinking about these issues, violence, sex, content, what's our responsibility? We're not responsible for everything that the audience does our content. How do we navigate that? I encourage you to check out our core foundations course. Uh, dealing with Bezalel principles and other principles for thinking clearly about culture, Christianity, and the content we engage with. But right now, let's look at the question about God redeeming Hollywood. The first core question we've got to look at is, can God redeem it? Is he powerful enough to do it? Or is it so bad it's just it's beyond redemption? Give up? Let it fall in the ocean? This is basically a question about God's ability and power. It questions his sovereignty and his omnipotence. If we look at Luke chapter 1, verse 37, we read, Nothing will be impossible with God. And in Job 42, 1 to 2, we read, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. So can God redeem the city of Los Angeles or the entertainment industry? Yes, absolutely yes, he can. That leads us to the second core question is, would God want to redeem it? This question really hits at God's compassion. Consider these words from Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. But it's also a question about God's nature as a redeemer. Is he a redeemer? And what does he redeem? Only individuals? Well, consider 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 23. And what one nation on earth is like your people, Israel, whom God went to redeem for himself. God redeemed an entire nation. Or consider Romans 8.21. Creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. God is redeeming all of creation when Christ comes again. So think about it. If God can redeem all of creation, of course he can redeem any city, any industry. To believe otherwise is to become like Jonah, who is mad at God that he had mercy on Nineveh. Go read it. It's a short book. Too many Christians have done this, allowing hatred to grow in their hearts toward Hollywood. But this is sinful. We must pray for them and desire that God redeems it all, as improbable as it may seem to us. If we don't think God cares, that he's powerful enough, that he doesn't redeem, then we have really painted a picture of a God who's not the God of the Bible. It's some other idolatrous God who you want it to be a certain way. This is not the God of the Bible. We need to come back and say, do we really believe in this God and repent of our bitterness towards people, our hatred of people, and once again, ask God to shape our hearts more like his. And this leads us to the third question. How does God redeem cities and industries? How does God do it? Well, if we consider Jonah and the story of his preaching to Nineveh, we realize that God used people to speak clearly to the people in the city and the leaders and then God convicted their hearts. And if God can bring a pagan nation to repentance, 
what can he do with Hollywood? Which, whether you know it or not, still has quite a few Christians in it. There are plenty that have moved out of L.A., but they're still involved in the industry. So a lot of people have moved to Texas, and Nashville, and Georgia, and Florida, but there's still many here. If we remember God's character, that he's faithful and full of compassion, we can begin to ask God to show us how he might redeem the industry today. And one more thing, if you read the Old Testament prophecies, you'll see God's heart for justice, but you'll also see God's patience and compassion. What I mean is, we see this in Jeremiah 18. It's a concept that is the heart of the prophecies of judgment. And the idea is this, if you don't repent, you're going to experience judgment. But if you do repent, God will relent. He will not judge and punish you. You see, just as God has mercy on Nineveh, after Jonah warned them, God's going to judge them, they repent and God doesn't do it. That's the implication. If you repent, this judgment will not come. So we shouldn't read those passages and conclude that when God is angry over sins and injustice, he always brings judgment. Sometimes people repent and he forgives them. And we should rejoice in that. And this shouldn't really shock us at all because that is exactly how God treats us. We deserve judgment. We sin. We screw up. We're no better. But if we repent, God has mercy upon us. You may recall 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That is the heart of God and the heart of the character of God. He's slow to anger, longing to redeem us. So, can God redeem Hollywood? Yes, absolutely. Would God want to redeem Hollywood? Of course. Which brings us to the last significant question, how does God do it? First, he does it through his spirit, convicting hearts and minds and transforming lives. Second, through people like Jonah, in this case, Christian creatives who are true salt and light, who are trusted, who speak the truth as God directs them. And third, this happens through the actions of God himself. In his time, God exposes evil, calls us to repentance, and brings judgment upon evildoers. And we've seen this. Think about exposing evil. God orchestrated the exposing of evils of Harvey Weinstein and other men like him. And this male-driven sexualization of women in the industry, it's been here for decades. You go watch some old movies, there's so much unnecessary, crass sexualization. God raised up women and men, journalists, writers, to confront this. Someone with conviction and courage to address all the sickening and destructive ways in which Harvey Weinstein treated women. So many people tried, but were silenced because of Harvey's immense power and his control over film and newspapers and news stations. He silenced so many for years until God said enough. God raised up Ronan Farrow and women journalists with journalistic shrewdness and the conviction to write the truth about Harvey and all Harvey's machinations. He hired Israeli intelligence people to get dirt on the journalists and hired tons of lawyers and threatened people. God didn't let any of it stop what needed to happen. God used quite a few to expose people like him and sexism and racism in the industry, and the list is long, but God despises any hatred of others. We cannot look down on anyone because of their skin color, their ethnicity. Again, God gave people the courage and conviction to address the lack of racial diversity and the lack of women at every level of industry in Hollywood. The good old boys club was not God-honoring, we should all rejoice that it's being changed. There will always be challenges. It isn't as bad as it was. It's getting better. Now, God gave us a free will and allows men and women to do evil things. But there comes a time when he will limit those deeds in this process. God works through people and institutions to bring about change. Just remember the prophet Nathan used by God to convict David of his grievous sins, adultery and murder. And those who do not listen and repent are judged and punished. How many times did Judah and Israel end up being punished by God because of their sinfulness, their idolatry, their horrible practices like sacrificing their own little children to other gods in the fire, to Moloch? You know, for such evil, God used other countries to judge them through war and captivity. Sometimes God will go to extreme lengths to show us our sin and to administer consequences for our sin. So what can you do moving forward? Well, pray for ministries like ours. We're in L.A., making a difference. Pray for Christians who have stayed in L.A. Pray for Christians who have moved to Nashville or Texas or some other town. 
and they're trying to make a difference there. It's a trying time. A lot of new opportunities, new challenges. And I know some people are called to stay while others are called to move on and be salt and light somewhere else. That's great. We should all go where we're called. God can and will use us all in various places around the world. And now you can shoot movies with a lot less equipment and edit and everything anywhere in the world. It's amazing what we can do now. So if you care about these issues, support ministries like ours who are really teaching creators to think clearly about these issues, how to be salt and light, not a knee-jerk reaction or condemnation, but how to be salt and light be effective in this arena. And look for talented Christians in the artistic fields and support them so they can become salt and light in a dark industry. Thank you so much for taking time to watch this video. Let me know down below in the comments if this was helpful to understand the biblical distinction between how the Bible addresses sexuality and violence versus how the world is addressing it, and even the issue of portraying Christians uh, in the media. And then let me know your belief on can God redeem Hollywood? And where are you at? Was this challenging? And was this encouraging? And how can we continue to encourage one another to believe in a God big enough to redeem anything, even when it looks very dark? If you enjoyed this, take a second to like and subscribe. But I really want to encourage you to be salt and light in a world that desperately needs it. Check out the next video right here.